Okay, well, I'll kick us off if that's all right with you, Pam. Yeah, please. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is our first fireside chat post project. Uh, this is the new old home fireside. So we're going to be discussing the slide deck that came out a couple weeks ago. And uh, this is a Yak Collective project. A lot of the people here have been at least tangentially associated with it, but a lot of you are also brand new and are maybe curious, trying to figure out what the deck's about, but also what the organization's about. Uh, organization is, to put it loosely, it's not, there's no formal organization. Uh, there is a, a Rome site and there's a Discord uh, server and there's a lot of discussions that happen. But the Act Collective is, is kind of a cloud of a consulting agency in the sense of being wispy and diffuse and at times concentrated and stormy. It's a, it's a plaza and a pop-up think tank and a dojo for consulting katas for apprenticing. It's an experiment in network governance. And this was the second uh, completed project that came out of the Yak Collective. It was driven by Pamela Hobart, who we'll be, uh, we'll be passing to her in just a moment. But every Yak Collective project kind of has this structure where uh, one or two stakeholders drive the idea, other people come around and support them and see it through. We have a number of proposals right now that are getting finalized and the next round of projects will be kicking off in the near future. But things over to Pamela. She is the life coach for smart people and an independent philosopher in private practice. She proposed this project in April and I will let her explain the concept to, her, to you. Take it away. Thanks so much, Jordan. Hi, um, I'm Pamela Hobart and I'm a member uh, here of the Yak Collective. And basically um, I had this thought somewhere along the line that as people were doing more work at home, that there was something sort of old about that. You know, like when people were living on farms, uh, they worked there, there was sort of no artificial division between work and life. Um, but obviously uh, working from home on your computer is, is not like living on a farm. So there's something new about it. So I pitched this idea, the new old home, um, just sort of as a theme to see what other people could do with it. And uh, the yaks really showed up. We had a, a large uh, group of fellow yaks sort of come up with their own angles and ideas about what the new old home might mean. And so we were able to put together this, uh, this deck pretty quickly uh, with a wide variety of models from people uh, in different areas, uh, different levels of speculation, uh, different sort of predictiveness or philosophical angles. And uh, we're really happy to share some pieces of that with you tonight. Um, I sort of kicked off the project with this idea of mine, but I really had very little bandwidth to do it because I'm also a mother of three. Uh, my oldest child's four uh, and my baby just turned one. So it's been pretty nuts with no childcare during most of this time. So my co, uh, my co lead here, Drew Shorno, um, who I will allow to introduce himself in a moment, really stepped up to help with a lot of the organization and design of the deck. Uh, so we'll hear from Drew. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I uh, <laughs> just um, uh, decided to um, start doing a bunch of work for this and kind of rose, um, rose up to being the co-editor without any particular um, qualifications for that. Uh, <laughs> Um, That's the qualification. Yeah, just, <laughs> just be work. willing to uh, do the work, whatever. Um, I was also, uh, uh, you know, caretaking for my uh, grandma at home while while um, editing most of this. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, I have. Uh, <laughs> God, I'm so nervous. <laughs> um, I feel really grateful to have been part of this. I, I feel really proud of the, the thing that we came up with. Um, and uh, yeah, so we're going to go through all of the, um, we're going to go through the deck and talk about some highlights and interesting, um, did I share the right thing? I'm kind of confused here. Let's see. I see it says started screen sharing, but then Share screen. I think it went back away. Here. I think we're yeah, perfect. Good. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so <laughs> here's our beautiful deck. Um, this is mostly Drew's handiwork. Um, you can open it up, Drew. We'll go to the table of 
contents. I think if you just, yeah, okay. So here's table of contents. We have many contributions. We're gonna just talk about these six sections real, real quick. Um, we have a couple of contributors from section, well, Drew and I contributed and um, we have a couple other who'll, who will be chiming in in the appropriate place. So the first section here was lenses on the new old home. Um, let's take a look in there. Um, so here's Venkat's module. He was talking about this um, sort of sci-fi scenario where the home is basically uh, thought of as having sort of portals into different uh, areas that are very far away. And the more that we live online right now, the more this sort of sci-fi scenario is becoming true. Uh, and I have, a, I have a little bit in a couple of slides here. You can go ahead, Drew. Yeah, so my, uh, I wrote um, earlier this year, sort of in before COVID times, I wrote sort of a mini manifesto about the purposes of home. And these two purposes in the, in the pink box um, are sort of the, the lesser noticed purposes. Your home helps to establish your personal identity and it also is a tool that you can use to emotionally regulate yourself. Um, and these are, these are issues that have been heightened in many ways now that we're spending more time at home um, and also changed. So if people are not coming into your home as much as before, you are more establishing your identity to yourself than like to guests. And also we have different emotional regulation needs than we did a few months ago um, because emotions are running much higher. And also we um, sort of are, the home is being required to do more functions than it did before. So you can go back and read all of that if you like. Um, you can keep going, Drew. This is, yeah, some more modules on that. Cool. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, places and spaces, this whole section is about just sort of um, ideas in like kind of architecture and different trends that are shaping um, design of spaces. Um, uh, we had Venk uh, Venkat's thing about domestic cozy going into hard cozy, which is sort of um, domestic cozy is like a, um, identifying this particular trend among uh, Gen Z uh, kind of uh, valorizing like re relaxation and kind of like wearing your snuggie at home uh, and um, the kind of like the, the potential for that to harden into like a generational stance rather than just a passing trend due to COVID is kind of what this, this is about. Um, this section, Housing Affordability, was interesting as uh, just sort of talking about how remote work um, might accelerate the flight of young people from large American cities to like sort of more reasonably priced American cities. Um, this is my section, third space and travel as a tool. This one's about, there's this idea in architecture called, um, of the third space, which is like, yeah, your first space is your home where you live. And then your, the second space is like your, the office space where you get your work done. And then, you know, like the third space is this, uh, <clears throat> the place where you go to, uh, you know, relax and hang out with friends and, and see people or whatever. And so um, a lot of, a lot of companies and places take that very seriously as a, as a, uh, an ideal, like Starbucks is really, is an example of a company that like very specifically sees himself as a third space and it leads to a lot of uh, intentional design decisions around like, um, you know, have making sure that the bathrooms are open to the public and knocking people out if they don't buy a coffee and just sort of like this is a space for everyone to come and and hang out and relax and then you know we sell coffee on the side um so the idea is like um if if home and work are collapsing to the same space like what does it look like when um the third space also has to be incorporated into um where you live um and kind of a little bit of an exploration of, of um, digital third spaces, which is this sort of idea of like, how can we use hack game engines to allow us to hang out with our friends online? Um, and then travel ritual is another, um, this is sort of like a, like a pointing out that um, the traveling from home to a separate workspace or from room to room in your house, um, sit kind of kind of acts as a ritual that sets you up to um, be in different modes of 
being. So like the idea that like when you brush your teeth at night, it kind of it is a ritual that makes it makes you ready to go to sleep. Um, and so like like if we have to if we have to kind of kind of condense down and use the same spaces for more different kinds of activities, like how can we intentionally design rituals that will help us do the different kinds of tasks we need to get done in those spaces. Um, those are mine. Um, I'll just quickly talk about um, Michael Collins' um, section, which is uh, about, um, it's really interesting, like, I guess, um, tuber uh, tuberculosis and, um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to think of this word, uh, sanatoriums. So like, like what, a lot of what we think of as, as modernist architecture is inspired from, it comes from, from sanatoriums and uh, the tuberculosis um, reality and kind of, kind of drawing a parallel from that to um, how coronavirus can and will shape the design of homes, uh, which I think dovetails really nicely with Sharida's um, new old pattern language, which I'll let her talk about it herself, but it's basically just like um, coming up with a language to describe the design of homes taking into account um, post-COVID considerations. So do you want to uh, pop in. Yeah, for sure. So um, I think a lot of people are, are familiar with a pattern language. Um, it's a really good and comprehensive and very accessible tool, I think, if you're trying to design something. Um, but I think COVID has kind of accelerated the need to rapidly rebuild and redesign certain things. Um, for example, in my own life, I'm living in like a 800 square foot home with two dogs and three adults. And we're all working here and living here. Um, and that's great, but it also presents some challenges. So uh, if you go to the next slide, I think, Drew, um, I kind of go and dissect some of the new considerations that are really eminent and important now. Um, and basically my thesis is that now home actually has to be a home, an office, a gym, a cafe, a school, a farm, a warehouse, and a workshop that's like so many functions uh, kind of densely compacted into one space. Um, and if you go uh, one more slide, I did some kind of analysis, a design analysis here. Um, we're already seeing people actually respond to these uh, novel demands of home. Um, so we'll have the atomized solution by the Zen work pod. Um, that's kind of just putting your office literally on the same property but it's not very well integrated into your environment. And then of course you have people kind of like moving into communes um, and kind of trying to replicate a village, which is a lot more traditional, but what if we could do something better? Um, I actually wrote a Substack post later kind of riffing off of Ben Katz's uh, Farcaster Mansion idea. And I was trying to consider like, what if you actually did have these four worlds? Um, maybe you need to have like portals or something to kind of transition between those worlds. Also kind of riffing off of what Drew said, so travel as ritual. Um, and then later I actually spoke with Jordan and instead of doing travel, you could just have cues. So maybe you just change clothes um, before you go and do work or you do makeup or something like that. So it could take, uh, it could take ritual forms as well as actual architectural or design forms, but um, I think that kind of analysis would be really helpful right now. All right, running, running the new old home. So uh, let's open this one up. Um, we had a section at the beginning here from Toby uh, Shoren, and he basically is sort of analyzing some of these themes that were really my beginning idea in much more depth. So. What were things like, how do you run a home um, in sort of post-industrial revolution? Like you're sending factory workers out into the world. Um, and like then our recent past that seemed like it was sort of the perpetual future and now the actual future. So what comes next? Let's flip the page. So previously there were sort of all these factors propping up um, family homes functioning in the way that they did. So the public education system and single family home ownership are very tightly interlocked. Um, 
This is sort of Elizabeth Warren II income trap type stuff. You buy more home in a different place than you may even want or need because you have to get into a decent school district. And this is sort of a this is um, sort of a zero sum game uh, that that locks families in, and that leads to some of what you see about dual career culture. Um, but basically now a lot of people who maybe weren't even curious about homeschooling or digital like online education for their children have been really thrust into that. We're already seeing some of the backlash uh, as it has not worked well, but whatever uh, half-assed online dis distance learning your children received this spring it is not actually what um, online education has to offer. And a lot of people's uh, imaginations have been open to this now. So, um, so basically, this may precipitate some proliferation in private education services, uh, and then families may sort of rediscover that they don't have to live in the most expensive places, that they can take, retake ownership of some of these things. Like you're being forced to retake ownership of your child's learning if you're running the classes, but then you realize that the classes aren't good. So then you want to, you know, if you're going to be stuck playing teacher, you want to do it in like a way that actually makes sense. Um, so this may uh, sort of shift cultural values even as people take things back um, under their own wings at home. Let's flip this over. So, oh, here's my second module. Um, this, this is sort of like what, you know, they promised us flying cars and we got, well, what did we get? So in your home, you have a ton of appliances. Um, it sort of seems like they should be saving labor uh, you know, you don't have to like scrub the clothes on a board and you may not have to wash your own dishes. Um, you don't have to sweep over and over because the vacuum is like powerful enough to suck your face off, but everyone's still pressed for time. So what happened? Um, I hear this slide is basically a, a about the thesis presented by Ruth Rose Schwartz Cowan in this book called More Work for Mother, which is a really interesting um, sort of ethnographic look at um, families and women and their time. And what she basically finds um, corroborated through a variety of sources is that what happened between the old home and the, the new home is that you used to have everyone pitching in in a somewhat ungendered way around the house. So like children were beating rugs and they're doing dishes and they're like milking the cow or whatever. And the machines sort of took over everyone's work except for moms. Um, Cause someone has to push the buttons and someone has to sort of manage the headspace to manage all the things. And so the person who ends up being the fragmented button pusher is mom. Um, it's not quite as physically rigorous as it used to be, but at the same time, standards of living have, have risen dramatically. So let's flip this over. So uh, for instance, food got real complicated. Like uh, tasks sort of expand to fill time just across all domains of life. So Whoever's doing the cooking can always, you know, whether you're scrambling a few eggs for dinner or you're like cooking a whole, you know, blue aprons that take like 90 minutes, they lie to you. Um, it, it fills the time. Uh, standards, this is one area where standards have really increased. So everyone loves to, you know, that Twitter account that makes fun of like jello meat things from the 50s or whatever, but it, it's not fair to judge them um, by our standards. The, the market has brought us such a ridiculous uh, diversity of foods. And in fact, supply chain issues recently have really um, made us realize just how much we take those things for granted. Um, mom now is not just like the microwave button pusher. She's also trying to decide, um, are my kids eating enough vegetables? Like, are they eating organic? Did they eat the same thing too many times this week? Like, is this food a little expired? It's just not what it used to be. Um, and people have gotten their identity all tied up in food. Um, so that's where a lot of those nutritional concerns come as well. Um, so uh, it, I'm not optimistic that we're just an iteration of dishwashers or clothes washers away from mom being truly liberated. Um, we're actually sort of further than ever because now she's also expected to work um, and run the distance learning and run all the machines. And when they break, guess who's calling the repair guy? Um, so that's, that's where the time went. 
Oh, and this is another interesting point from, the, from that book that I really loved. And it's that it is not lazy to have things delivered to your home. Um, this is the way things were. Me, uh, Pam, I think somebody's typing. Whoever's typing, could oh. you mute yourself? Yes, someone's typing. Please mute. Um, it is, it, things were delivered to people's homes until very recently. And the reason that home delivery ever broke down is because the stay-at-home mom who is running all the machines also got a car and a car centric suburb. And so she became tasked with running and getting all this stuff. So like, um, it is actually sort of another resurgence in an older way of life to have things brought to your home. But most of those things are not fully automated. So there is another aspect where it's less physical work um, than it might've been in the past, but there's still a lot of cognitive overhead involved in managing these things. Um, let's turn it over, I forget. Oh, um, this was a cute module from um, Thomas Hollins about sort of how to inject a minimum, minimum viable fun into your day when you have sort of open ended routines that are, you know, like, it, it, there's a tension between how much people like habit and how much people like sort of opportunities for serendipity and entertainment. And when you're at home physically, um, what does serendipity and chance fun really end up looking like? And do we impoverish ourselves when we don't have those kinds of opportunities? So before you might have, um, you know, you're in some intramural sport with the team from work or you're like going to trivia night and now there's things more like, you know, obviously Zoom, everything, um, but maybe there will be some innovations in like fitness apps and sort of um, influencers will like run stuff that sort of, you know, contests, whatever. Um, I think we don't actually have a great idea of what these are yet because until recently they were competing with actually really fun in real life things. But if you give it a little time, um, some of these, some of these fun things will arise. Um, yeah, there it is. Minimum viable novelty is a, is a, is a great one. And uh, the Peloton, is a good example of how you might have a routine um, of jumping on your bike, but they also, you know, it's sort of gamified and they've got new playlists. And so that, that helps. Um, and this, I think is a good example of how all these models are really inter interrelated because like, this is not really separate from places and spaces because there's like trend pieces on how people are carving out Peloton nooks in like their 400 square foot Upper East Side studio. Um, so it's all very interrelated. Mm -hmm. Let's flip it over. Cool. Right. So this is you, Drew. Oh, my God, it's okay. oh sorry. I thought there was another one. Um, <clears throat> I think we're good. Yeah, so um, what goes to Polis and back was interesting. It's kind of about how um, uh, in ancient Greece, the seat of power shifted from being part of the home to being like out in public. And so um as like work and other things come back into the home like the seat of uh political power is also coming back into the home um i think that's i don't know if that's a great summary of that it's my understanding anyway um nuclear family is anomalous it's kind of self-explanatory but also like really good look at how like um what we think of as like the, the normal traditional nuclear family is like a very modern product um and families historically have been much larger and more varied and like even um you know just like these big compounds with many many kind of like semi related people living there this we kind of touch touch on this later with um the inter intergenerational living section but um uh visible knowledge work this one was a really cute uh section i loved um especially this uh, this slide um seeing roxanne like taking our conference call and like pretending to work on a laptop and stuff. The, the idea is just sort of like, people didn't really know what knowledge work was before, unless they were actually doing it. But now that it's been brought home, people can, you can see other people like on conference calls and emailing and just sort of other knowledge work tasks that were otherwise invisible. Um, this kind of uh, goes really nicely into this section, which uh, the knowledge work apprenticeship, uh, another alternate title to this one was like reclaiming child labor, which uh, I thought was very like, um, uh, it's very kind of edgy and clickbaity. And um, 
I think if that, that was like the title of a, a standalone essay, I think that would probably get more views, but I thought this was a bit more um, clear, uh, just specifically what we're talking about. So, you know, historically like child labor has been banned because it was like dangerous and like not in children's best interest to force them to, you know, get their hands chopped off in industrial machines and stuff. Um, but now we're basically, we're, children are doing labor in school, like when we force them to do like multiplication tables and um, I don't know how many like PowerPoint presentations and things I was supposed to do in school, um, you know, Word documents and stuff. So it's like, why not get them to do actual knowledge work um, and like teach them, teach them that way. Uh, if, if we're training them to be like, to grow up to be middle-class knowledge workers anyways, like why not just get them started um, doing real tasks rather than sort of waste that labor. Um, and I think this is like a really good example, of like, like getting a, a child to figure out how, like what groceries to buy, what quantities of groceries to buy, uh, what different brands are. There's all sorts of interesting uh, lessons to be learned from, from, you know, buying, being involved in the task of buying groceries. Um, and then also uh, product management, which is more of a, uh, <coughs> a, you know, very adult task of like, how do you organize the development of a, a product? Um, and that would be like really, you know, useful experience for kids. So I think that was, that's a kind of a cool concept. Uh, and I think that's back to you, Pamela. Yeah, so um, again, like families, this module is not really separate from you know, the previous one. We came up with that grocery buying example in the Knowledge Work Apprenticeship on, um, on my weekly chat, uh, which I'll plug briefly. We hold a chat on the Discord on, on Sunday uh, evenings. And we came up with that because we were trying to think about like, um, you know, people complain that like, oh, young adults don't know how to adult anymore. They're like bad at adulting. And some of those adulting things are um, work related and some of them are life related. And many, but not all of them are, are partially or wholly online. And the question is like, why is there such an absurd gap between what you actually need to do as an adult, even, even in a knowledge work job or just to run your life, you know, like bureaucratic, like get in touch with your health insurance, get in touch with your bank. Um, why is there this huge gap where everyone is trying to just sort of like figure it out on their own? This is not a normal way um, to get launched into adulthood. So like, what does it look like if you wanted your child to be able to do the grocery shopping? Previously, that was pretty easy, like send them to the store, give them a little list. Well, we get all our groceries delivered. We did even before the pandemic. I could, if I wanted to, I could transition my children into learning that. Um, much earlier than you'd think, uh, but it wouldn't happen by accident because I can always just like do it on my phone and then they don't know. They don't know like, what do I swap for what? Or what do you do when the credit card doesn't go through? Or, you know, and those are learnable. Um, and so that brings us to families. Um, the first module in here is um, on intergenerational living, um, which is, again, the, the nuclear family is anomalous. There have been many changes back and forth. Uh, recently, American culture has kind of taken a pot shot at like basement dwellers, or I think boomerang adults, young adults is one of the terms for when like you graduate college and you can't get a job and you end up back at home. Like that is sort of unequivocally a failure mode. Um, a lot of this is coming under pressure anytime there's an economic downturn. And now um, things are very complicated seeing as how COVID um, is worse for older folks. If you do not live and quarantine with the grandparents, you basically are in this polarized situation where either you live with them and or are quarantined in, in like a bubble with them and you can see them a lot, or you really may not be able to see them at all um, for possibly years. So, this module points out here, we can, we can flip the, yeah, there's like, here are, all the, here are the change drivers. There are a lot of young adults, even with children who are not homeowners, um, so they can move around or they'd have to make different choices in order to buy a home. Um, outsourced childcare is extremely prohibitively expensive um, and people are reconsidering where they are geographically, how much space they need. Um, I think a, a lot of 
a lot of trends that maybe were sort of in the works or not thought of clearly socioculturally are now coming to the fore in this way. Um, the next module here in families uh, is from Jordan, who we heard from at the beginning this evening. Um, Jordan has a very interesting uh, position in that he's involved in some mid-pandemic co-parenting. Um, Jordan, you want to take a, a couple minutes to talk to us about, uh, about this? Yeah, for sure. Cool. Uh, it was interesting. Discussing this with uh, Shrita earlier this week, I realized that the, the situation of co-parenting as a demographic uh, illegibility issue is really just one of several types and the thing that I'm highlighting here is that you know when people are tracking your the, the occupants of your household right there's usually a fairly strict uh, you know definition for a census or things like that for defining who is or is not your in your household for tax purposes or for census purposes and a lot of times if you have multiple households that you are legitimately a member of, um, there's that, you just pick one. You say, well, you know, 50, 51% of the time, or I'm gonna flip a coin or what have you. And that's fine in most cases, but particularly in response to a pandemic where you're trying to deal with contact tracing. You know, Pam, Pam mentioned the, the fact that I'm, I'm dealing with a co-parenting situation. I have four kids and we have a fairly rigorous, you know, What's your, what, what's your processes at household A, household B, and like other connected households? Because we have grandparents, we have, you know, their mom's boyfriend, and having that uh, communication, and then having that symptom tracking and saying, well, uh, so and so had this symptom on this date, and we don't think there's a concern. Um, but when you start talking about contact tracing and things like that, the idea of uh, singular households where it's just that's where you are isn't realistic or you create situations where people actually end up in a weird legal um, hole where maybe they're legally required to have kids be moving between households in a way that doesn't comply with state or federal guidelines for uh, um, stay at home orders and things like that. So that was the specific tension that I was highlighting here. But as I was discussing it, I realized that there's other, there's other issues where there's that kind of um, overly discreet government definitions that fail when you start looking more closely at the situation. And the question and the tension that people have to reckon with is what are the trade-offs? Because you can, a lot of times you can improve services and you can improve other elements if you have better data. So if you start treating uh, households as dynamic and you start treating uh, families as more than just the biological uh, biologically repaid, uh, related people in your households, that can tell you a lot more, especially when the household dynamics are shifting the way that Pam and Drew were talking about. Um, additionally, you know, you look at things right now, people talking a bit about race, but race is something that's been very uh, much made legible by authorities in certain ways, and sometimes in ways that are very counter to uh, the underlying cultures. In Canada, where I'm, where I'm from, there's a law that defines um, native ancestry. And that's a very British superposition uh, that came over and above the actual indigenous tribes, some of whom you did use bloodlines to decide who was in or out of the tribe. But a lot of them didn't function off of blood relations and that was imposed on them by you know, the, the British Canadian government. So, Questions of who's in your household, questions of uh, multiple homes, questions of uh, grades of race are all areas where there's a trade-off because uh, it is a little bit of an invasive thing to provide. And I know there's pushbacks around uh, whether or not to even answer census questions if you're in some categories. And if so, how do you answer them? But there's also the the, there, there are some clear benefits to providing more granular and gradient information in these. And I feel like that tension is going to increase as these trends mature. I'll pass it back to you, Pam. Yeah, thanks, Jordan. I think there's, there's some points sort of generalizable in there uh, to some situations that I'm facing now too, like of the illegibility um, of the real state of affairs in that 
no one even knows if in-home nannies are technically uh, forbidden by the stay-at-home order. And those are very common thing here in New York City. It's compounded by the fact that most uh, in-home nannies are paid off the books, and that's largely by their own request and not by the matter of like being uh, exploited by their employer families. So you have this whole kind of gray economy where people are not knowing how to uh, proceed. And I begged my nanny to come back a couple of weeks ago and that was sort of like, we don't know if we're strict, we don't know if it's, I mean, it sort of always was legal if you aren't paying them on the books. Is it also like sort of illegal in the sense of defying an executive order um, and is it really that much more risky? I mean, so it's sort of like the co-parenting situation where like she's been quarantined, your family's been quarantined. It is more risk than you faced before, but it is not, um, you know, like going to a mosh pit. So if this is our new normal, like everyone can't just work from home with a billion kids in their hair forever. They're also telling us the economy's in the toilet, like something, something, has, something has to give. Um, so certainly these issues are only um, only becoming thornier as time goes on. Thank you, Jordan. Um, I think we're up on our last, is this our last section here? Yeah, Drew, Drew will talk about a few last modules here. Mm -hmm. So um, this last section sort of wrapping things up, talking about some ideas going forward. Um, the first one's about, it's called activating multiple digital personae. It's about the idea that like, in different situations in our lives, we, in, we act in different ways uh, based on the context of the situation. So like when you're on the phone with your parents, you might talk and act in a different way than if you were chatting with your friends or if you were like in a professional business context or whatever. So um, this is kind of uh, pointing out that those, that code switching or whatever has to also happen in digital contexts and like sort of how you can intentionally think about and craft your know, different digital personas or masks or whatever um, in different uh, contexts um, and talks about a little bit about those contexts. And uh, this section is, I think a lot of this deck is kind of uh, fairly um, optimistic about the future. I think this is a little bit of a, um, kind of reining in a little bit of that optimism, talking about um, how doing everything from home uh, is not like this like wonderful pansy kind of thing. Um, and comparing it to this paper, uh, the limits of peer production. Um, uh, yeah, the, the home production of masks is a good clear example of that, where it's just like, um, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's sort of serving a, a short-term purpose of having people throw these masks at home and just get food and help it and uh, purposes of it. So, you know, not that, that the masks aren't as good as what you get producing factories. And, um, yeah. and then uh, the last section here is uh, new neighbors for the new old home. Um, Amanda is, uh, taking a look at um, attitudes towards pre like attitudes that we have towards um, work and towards home in the pre mid and post COVID worlds using this uh, cat causal layered analysis technique. Um, I think it's really interesting to look at um, the base metaphors that we're, we're using to think about homes, which you know, apparently before before COVID, it's home as a transit station, work as theater. Home is where the mask is lowered. Um, mid COVID, uh, home is this like bunker, and then like you know you're you're in home, which is the, the only safe place, and everywhere outside of home is like this like dangerous COVID infested um, zombie apocalypse world, and uh, uh, the post COVID world where um, home is collage. I'm not 100 percent sure what um, what this means. I'm sure like none of us really know what the world is going to be like post COVID, but just um, kind of, I guess it's maybe the idea of like picking and choosing different um, aspects of what work life used to be and what home used to be and 
um, that stuff that Shreda was talking about, all those different sort of contexts and um, bringing them together in this kind of like interconnected mesh. Um, yeah, and I don't know, it's kind of, I feel like it's kind of a nice, nice note to end on. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the end of the deck. <laughs> that's our deck, yeah. Um, thank you, Drew. I really, uh, there's so much in there, but at the same time, there's so much left to see about how these things will start to pan out. And we sort of hope for something about the new old home um, to be sort of more like a decentralized research program that extends in time that starts with this deck rather than ending with it. Um, I think um, it might be a good time. I'm not sure if any of you out there have any questions um, about any of these modules or if you have any interesting, um, you know, personal experiences in any of these regards that you you might want to raise. Uh, I think there's not too much in the chat right now. You can put in the chat if you have a question or, let's see. Yeah, does anyone, yeah, just say something in the chat if you have a question, I'll give you a minute and okay ryan okay shrita you can start you want to start looking at this and moderating a little bit now since this is rolling um so ryan do you want to ask your question to jordan peacock regarding co-parenting um okay he says, I like the idea about federated homes based off of different functions, but how do you prevent this from heading towards something like ethno-nationalism? <laughs> um, this, this was the question to me. I, I'm trying to figure out how that maps to co-parenting directly. I guess, so one thing I will say, uh, I, I was actually homeschooled for uh, fifth, sixth, 10th, 11th, and 12th grades in Canada and then Kuwait. And uh, I grew up like in a conservative Christian evangelical family. And I am thankful in that my, my parents had a very strong academics first, you know, have a wide range of knowledge. You know, they had their biases, but they were definitely on the side of quality education. But some of the families that we homeschooled alongside, particularly in Kuwait, uh, very much were in it for the indoctrination of their children angle. And it, it's a mixed bag. I, I th it'll be interesting to see out of the families that do choose to not return to schools, um, how many of them do so out of, a got, out of a sense of, I can develop more capacity in my children this way, um, versus how many of them are kind of in a full cultural retreat trying to um, you know, prevent their children from hearing things that clash with maybe the ideas that they want to present. Great. Um, I think I have a question for Pam from Chris Reed. Uh, interested in hearing more about this, um, about this as a beginning rather than an ending. What kind of outgrowths do you want to see from this? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, some of, some of the models in this deck sort of, um, could be fleshed out uh, with empirical empirical work. So like the knowledge work apprenticeship is something that specific types of workers and would have to try, you know, and, and see if any of that type of education is impartable to which students, how, you know, is it worth it? Um, and that's not something we can determine from the armchair. The armchair is like the idea, right? Like, why can't you teach kids this stuff? Why can't they contribute in this way? But um, the rest is sort of, um, will have to be tested in specific families and specific enterprises. Um, I think some of some of the ways that this research might continue is just to see, I mean, right now people are faced with some types of choices about what like do we move somewhere else? Do we move closer to grandparents? Do we quit a job? Um, we're starting to see reports about people making choices of these kinds. There are starting to be moves again. 
there are very many women um, in particular who have left jobs. Um, they were not laid off, they, were, they quit because they could not handle um, doing distance learning for their children's education for a year or more. Um, and so the question is like, what are people actually going to do? And then how does this, how do these turn into feedback cycles, right? Like before you've made that choice to quit your job, you may be interested in how can I make it all work? If you're, if you find that you can't make it all work, then the question is like, so what now? Once you've quit, new possibilities become available. Um, and so we'll begin to see reports of how many people have done which thing and is it working for them? Um, certainly there's a lot of clickbait already about, um, you know, heightened anxiety and depression. There are very many causes of that that are difficult to disentangle, but some of the ideas in here are directly actionable by individuals. Like if you take the idea of travel as ritual seriously, you might be able to change your levels of anxiety at the margin by reordering your home. Um, not necessarily by spending a ton of money, but by taking very deliberate care um, in these ways. Of course, everyone already knew like, oh, you can get a home office or whatever. But when things get really, really tough, uh, you have to sort of up the ante on, on trying new things and seeing if they help at all. Um, so there are a lot of there are a lot of different directions that could go, and I think um, many of them require actual sort of empirical testing and feedback and see what actually starts to happen. Yeah, and I think um, like a good chunk of these slides, like at least half of them are just they're they're prompts, right? They sort of ask a compelling question or they're the beginning of a conversation that could continue, you know, the, the travels ritual thing or the the new old pattern language and she she Sharita didn't make one you know <laughs> she just pointed out that it could be made so there's all sorts of other work that, that uh, could spring out of this for sure um uh drew i guess maybe you can talk about this from a design perspective a uh, strange attractor asks about um airflow and building materials and very specific design specs uh i guess in regards to how air moves in buildings um in relation to COVID, like, do we think that's something that we need to focus on? Or, uh, like, what are our thoughts on those? Yeah, I think that's really, um, really relevant to that, um, the home is curative environment section. Um, just, it kind of was talking about, like, um, you know, considerations about COVID and how that actually will shape the construction of, of uh, our environments and also how it'll shape our tastes going forward. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't, I'm not actually an architect, so I don't know exactly how those uh, airflow and building materials will, will affect the, the shape of the spaces that we're in, but I'm sure that it's like a, a very interesting question to consider for someone who is an architect. Um, and, uh, I think it's actually, it, the narrativization of health is actually really relevant here because we see a lot of things, even as we acquire higher levels of information about what does and does not tra transmit COVID, there's still a high emphasis on like disinfecting surfaces. And that is not, there's, there's no real evidence to think that that's a significant vector of disease. But when people feel threatened and when they have the resources to do that and they can't actually control who's breathing around them, they're like, okay, buy all the Lysol. Like, um, so in, in, in that, in one of those modules, there's a link to like Washington story that was about architectural innovations. And some of them are like, it was the second you get in the house. And, and I think it goes to show that people really care about um, feeling clean, but how much that actually makes contact with actual disease prevention is still not 100%, even though we know more about you know, germ theory of disease than, than we did before. Um, so you may see things like people's hand sanitizer habits stick even sort of apart from, apart from the evidence. But there was something in those sanatoriums, there was an emphasis on, um, on ways to feel like you were outside when you were inside, um, like open, uh, you know, these door balcony things, 
that just made it feel very bright and light. And so that's something where they may have actually stumbled on something that was in fact health promoting without knowing exactly why. Um, and certainly a lot of buildings like here in New York City are not well ventilated, but we may have coincidentally missed some of the worst of it, or it would have been worse because there's no central AC everyone's got a window unit. Whereas places where that is in place, it seems so modern, it seems so nice, but like, what are they gonna retrofit it with like all these filters? I don't know. Mm -hmm. I would bet that all of those bathrooms that have lidless toilets and then the air blow, <laughs> right. air dryers. Oh, the air dryers. Refit, yeah. Ugh. Okay, um, we have a question from Alex, maybe Jordan or anyone can really jump in to answer. Um, do you feel that knowledge work apprenticeships could increase inequality? Um, Alex says that already one of the best indicators of whether someone goes to medical school is if their parents did. Uh, so if taken to its extreme, um, knowledge work apprenticeship is a return to the children do as their parents did. Uh, yeah, that's actually, um, we address that in the, in the slide. And it's really important because it's like, you know, you have your parent as a, a lawyer and then um, you come out of um, being raised with like, you know, 15 years of legal experience. You're just like way ahead of someone who doesn't have access to those resources. Um, you know, I think that it's, um, yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's there's, a, that, there's actually a really good empirical uh, example of this, which is the decline, the relative decline of women in computer science after the rise of the personal computer. And so when you had uh, a situation where you had no way of accessing a, a personal computer, um, there's a lot of the old mainframe programmers. I mean, there's a lot of barriers still for women going into computer science, but uh, the, the distribution got, you had a much larger pie after the rise of personal computers, but women as a percentage ended up being a smaller percentage. and one factor of that was the fact that with home computers, there was a very strong cultural incentive that the boys can program the Apple II or whatever, and uh, families not encouraging their daughters to do the same thing. And so you ended up with a, a cultural situation where the boys were coming to these programs with maybe a decade more hands-on experience than um, the women who were hitting that at the same time. And so I think those are legitimate risks. I think there's you know, preventatives for them, but that, that's one maybe historical analogy to that. Uh, sure, should we take one more question and then is that time? Um, we got, I think we said until 9.30, but we'll, we can, we don't have to go that whole time, but if there's more questions, we'll take yeah, whatever. Well, there's definitely a couple of, um, some more questions right now and people should feel free to continue to ask in the chat. Um, maybe you can answer this, Pam and Jordan, uh, and even Drew regarding the design, but in a small home, how do you give each kid their own space? <laughs> oh man. So until a few months ago, I lived in 600 square feet, two bedroom, one bath with my three children. Um, my three children are very small. So some of the concerns were less relevant than they would be for like teens. Um, but the long and short of it is that you don't, there, there isn't, any space um, to give them dedicated spaces. There are ways that you can make different areas of your home sort of multi-purpose. So like we've never really had a dining table that was like reserved as a dining table. We actually use like a $40 card table with a plastic top and it has been used for anything and everything you can imagine, right? Like sometimes they watch TV at it, which is actually computer, because we don't have a TV, because it would be impossible to design the space around television watching. Um, so uh, it has been hard with children this age, because even though they don't have privacy needs, like a teen might have, they do all sleep sort of at different times. So that is a real struggle. We have um, three or four white noise machines. And sometimes, you know, it involves stashing the one who's napping like in someone else's room or, you know, like ushering the dog out. So when the doorbell rings and someone's asleep in there, you know, it takes a lot of trial and error. Um, at the same time, like the nuclear family being anomalous, the the idea that people would have their own rooms, especially children, is very, very new. 
This is not um, a historically ordinary state of affairs. Um, so certainly people have grown up um, in you know, various uh, levels of satisfaction with this, but with sharing rooms for a very long time. Um, so I think it, a lot of it involves creativity and not, uh, not importing other people's living standards to your own space. Like you are never gonna have, I grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta. So like when I see my high school classmates posting what they're raising their children in, like, you know, cheap McMansions with like six bedrooms, I can't, if I import that into my own reality, it's like, oh, you're a bad parent. Like, why don't you have X, Y, Z? Um, at the same time, your children sort of being up on top of each other. It's not child abuse. It's a, just a different package and they get different things out of it. Um, yeah, I, I have three siblings. And at one point we were in an apartment of, you know, three bedroom apartment for the six of us. And it was my sister and then the three, the three boys. And when we finally got a place with an additional bedroom, originally it was going to be mine because I was the going, I was the eldest, but then we realized that um, the more important thing was that neither I or my next younger brother would have to deal with the youngest one or his friend. So we gave him the new bedroom so that we wouldn't have to deal with them. But, you know, we, we have a bit of a, a juggling act at our house. You know, I have the four kids and the eldest and the youngest are both girls. And so we have, kind of the, they have the smallest bedroom and it's my eldest bedroom because it gives her some privacy most of the time, except when the youngest needs to, you know, nap or go to the bed early. And then the boys room is also the playroom. And so it's like when all the youngest ones need to go play, they can do that. But, you know, you, you basically make everything do double or triple duty. And then you have maybe times of day or other kinds of contextual cues to kind of switch things over where it's like, okay, we're going to, we're going to clean up. And now this is the, the bed time quiet space or you know the kitchen table you say well this half of the table is going to be school working place or something um but you know people have made use made do with not very much space for years and years and years and it's really only recently where uh, a large number of people have had just ridiculous amounts of space and i don't think that's a real you know, it's not like you have to take a huge quality of life hit if you have a little less real estate, but it might take changing your expectations. Thanks, guys. Um, a question from Amir. Uh, he makes an observation that um, most of our contributors are U.S.-based, and uh, though we acknowledge a focus um, on the middle class and the deck, the, I guess, U.S. centricity is not acknowledged. Um, so he asks, and I think Drew might have a good response to this, uh, do any of the contributors feel that some of their models and prompts would be affected if they were thinking about the United Kingdom, France, Portugal, or whatever else? So I don't think those demographics are actually true. There's a number of European contributors. Um, uh, there's at least yeah. one Australian, there's some Asian. Well, they're not here right now because it's yeah. the middle of yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, I actually had I, I actually had some language about it having a U.S. bias, but then a lot of our international contributors um, asked me to take it out because they thought it was not reflective of the fact that it actually is kind of uh, well distributed around. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's just just the time slot. A lot of a lot of these guys are asleep right now, so. <laughs> Well, even a lot of us in the U.S. aren't from the U.S. <laughs> um, I think that addresses that question. Um, uh, there was a question earlier from Paul. Uh, so um, Paul is kind of asking uh, about evidence-based design and um, is asking if we, if any of the contributors see our work guiding the design of the next space. And what I think is an interesting question what evidence is actually missing to guide that transition from uh, taking it from ideas in our deck to actually uh, being executed in the real world? Um, do you have a, an opinion on that, Shreda? Um, I think uh, I think the situation with COVID is kind of rapid, and so uh, I think actually working in a group of people to come up with this new old pattern language would be really helpful because that way we can actually incorporate some sort of evidence um, and think about how people are actually living um, 
of course, uh, there would be like cultural issues. So we would have to like make it a cross-cultural study as well. Um, but I do think that uh, maybe current evidence which would, su would suggest that people actually are using technology much more or much more reliant on it. And so um, using that kind of evidence to really adapt some of these older patterns would be, uh, would be great. All right, well, I'll, I'll definitely reach out to some of you because I, I, until I read this book yesterday, I didn't realize that evidence-based medicine got married in health architecture to user-centered design. So I, I think there'd be opportunities to take some of the ideas in the deck and try and look at evaluating them as something that's in the world. So thanks. Thanks. Um, Drew, did you have anything else to add? No. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, Another question we had from Ryan uh, asking, how close is the traditional frat house to the new old home? Um, I don't know, Ryan, if you're actually on, if you want to elaborate a little bit, but uh, I do get the sense that, you know, the traditional frat house, I think I understand that it's multifunctional um, and you have a community of people living together, but that emphasis on high tech, I think is missing, which is a key part. Um, I think as Pam kind of illuminated and uh, you do actually have that uh, people, you know, of, of multi-generations maybe are living in this. It's not just like college age kids. Well, and I will just say, uh, I don't know how widespread this is in the broader U.S., but I know locally in the Twin Cities area where I'm at, I have both lived in a couple different uh large households that were, I guess, kind of frat house, but they were, there might be a couple, there might be a, a family with children, there might be a, you know, a single person, and you'd have like seven to 11 people in that household, but they weren't necessarily all related. And a lot of times you'd have different work schedules and things like that. And it was a combination of um, a kind of community. And often it was a economic necessity that drove it as well. You also see this sometimes with uh, poly families. Yeah, I think it's like, it's kind of a, a typical setup in like the San Francisco Bay area. And I know a lot of people in like Vancouver and stuff who do it too, like um, just like sort of larger houses with many rooms of um, kind of independent people living together and working together as a household. Um, I think maybe, maybe a distinction is that the new old home is um kind of based around like a traditional family even like like a broader um uh, broader than the new the concept of a nuclear family but it's still like everyone is um working together as an extended unit versus like these these living situations are very kind of uh individualistic and they come together to sort of um solve the problem of how do you live together well but not necessarily like they're not necessarily sharing finances or um other ways of coordinating so yeah some of those kinds of group homes like you say are are people who are trying to find ways to make especially urban life work when it's very expensive but they're still predicated on the idea that um that home is like where you retreat from from work and you sort of like care for yourself to the extent that you can go sent back out and do your work um and so even to the extent that they like share meal planning and stuff like that, it's still a home that is the retreat from the outside world. This is something that was starting to get weird in the Bay Area because there were people who were like working from computer based stuff in these really expensive, you know, like $2,000 a month like bed, but they're like working in it. And so that's where it started to break down is like, why are you, why, why are you trying to make this lifestyle work at such high expense when that is sort of the totality of your existence? Um, are you trying to get back out, send, launch yourself back out into work in the geographical area there? Um, but yeah, like, like I think Ben Kat mentioned in the chat, like the one of the central themes of the new old home is that it is uh, highly productive in a broad sense. So it is, it is pr productive both of like GDP, GDP 
key type of stuff and also productive of the things that don't get counted. Um, and whereas like a frat house is really consumptive, right? Like they're consuming high levels of education and they're consuming money in the hopes that it will become, um, that it will become an investment. But we all know that a lot of the consumption that happens during college is just that, it's just consumption. Um, and it does not convert heavily into investment except under the right circumstances. One of my favorite songs, such an LA. Oh. Are you on a call? Yeah, I just <laughs> Uh, Alex asks, um, do you think that we'll see an increased emphasis in private outdoor space going forward, especially in cities such as New York? Um, I think it's a great question. I think there's some kind of tension because uh, I know that a lot of my friends in the Bay Area or New York are actually just vacating the premises completely. And um, I think Pam made the astute observation that without the amenities of social life in New York City, um, what is the really like the point of actually paying that sort of rent to live in a concentrated space? Um, so I think in the future, uh, I don't know specifically about New York, what will happen. I do think the market might tip at least briefly, um, kind of not in New York City's favor, but maybe when rebuilding cities, there will definitely be kind of an emphasis, I think, uh, especially if that happens um, within the next generation or so, uh, the generations that actually have a cultural memory for COVID. Um, and it'll kind of depend on maybe some of the other future events as well. Um, I don't know if Drew or Pam or Jordan, if anyone wanted to add anything to well, I think I think Pam might have some opinions about this. I think I saw her tweeting about kind oh of my God. gearing up to be- Oh my God. Opening up. So, yeah, okay, so like virtually no, I'm not gonna say no one, but very, very few people in New York City have private outdoor space, even really, really rich people. Um, and they had the playgrounds closed until Monday, to my mind was at least a month, if not longer um, than was really warranted by the evidence. And part of the problem is that even in a city like this, there, unlike some of the other types of architectural things you might do, like improving ventilation or getting different appliances in your home, you really can't add private outdoor space later. Um, and there's so little new construction here and New York does everything it can to thwart that, right? Like it's not building heavily. Um, and so part of the problem is that Although there are fewer families in the city than there have been at other times, sort of like if a, if a rational central planner were like allocating the families, then maybe you could make it happen. I mean, for instance, we moved from a building that had a common outdoor space that was just wonderful and, and but it was shared to this is like a four story walk up. Um, it's ancient. It's 100 years old. And we live on the second floor. So out this window is the little yard and it belongs to the three single guys who live downstairs, right? Like they're the ones who have access to the yard and the rent on that apartment is a thousand dollars a month higher than this one. Um, so they have like, oh, they just got a big weight set. I can see it right from outside my window, right? Like they're doing, they're doing all these things that we're suggesting that you need now. Um, and so I don't know how you end up in the state of affairs where there are enough outdoor spaces such that the people who sort of need them the most get them and also can afford them because we're sort of a one and a half income family with these three kids and there are three people with full, um, you know, like yuppie incomes. Um, so I think that the reality of a city is that shared outdoor space has to be, um, has to be the first line solution for most people. And the question is, I mean, New York apparently dragged their heels on reopening it because they have no money and it's expensive to even just to like pick up the trash at the parks. So it was close to being real mutiny because um, everyone's kids are just driving them nuts. So an interesting counterpoint to that is in Minneapolis, what they did is on the roads that were near lakes or wooded areas and things like that, they blocked off part or all of the roads as like supplemental social distancing park adjacent areas. So it wasn't, it wasn't playgrounds, but giving people places to be pedestrians and to be out and have park-like experiences. Um, they, that was kind they, of a temporary measure. They did it here too, but what happened is that the streets that they've closed um, 
mostly have like takeout bars and takeout restaurants. And so it's just, people are just drinking in the street and like peeing all over the place. Now I've been to the takeout bars. I think it's fine that they stayed open, but it is not quite where you'd like, just let your two year old run around. It sort of was more a concession to pent up like young people who can't have their normal social life and not, not families. Um, thank you. I guess I wanted to turn it to Drew. Rosa asks, um, she wants to know, like, I guess, a little bit more about your caregiver situation and what is the best design for living in that situation? Yeah. Um, so my grandma, um, she lives fairly close by in a 55 plus complex. And we're actually in a bit of a legal battle with them because, um, we, she's past the point where she needs to basically have full-time care. And um, in Canada, all of the old folks' homes are not accepting new people and we wouldn't send her there volitionally anyways because that's like a huge number of old, pe old people in those homes are dying from COVID. Um, so um, the other option is just we have a large variety of, of I have uh, four siblings and so we all kind of take turns taking care of her at home and um, they are, we're, we're kind of in a legal battle with them because they don't want under 55 people staying in the complex for any reason. Um, and it's, it's, uh, I don't know. So um, another thing is like, we can't really bring her here because she has vascular dementia. So she, she gets a little bit confused um, when she's in like slightly different context than the home she's been living in for 30 years so um when we bring her here it's very hard to like kind of keep her occupied she just wanders around and wanders into people's rooms while they're trying to do other stuff and just is it's just like a very difficult situation that takes like a lot of brain power versus when she's at home where she's she's used to being you know you can set her up in front of the tv and put on um she's really into like suits and uh, heartland i think she likes heartland because she doesn't really quite understand the storylines of the shows anymore but she likes suits because it reminds her of the business she used to run and she likes heartland because it has a lot of horses <laughs> she likes like looking at the animals and stuff so um but she's just very happy to sit there and snack on whatever you give her and, and watch the show and so it's, it's a lot easier to watch her from home um I think it's it's. I think it's important if we're you know designing the future of homes or whatever. If we want to take care of elders in the home, to start living with them before they get to this point, um, like have them get used to sharing a space and um, composing themselves amongst a bunch of people before you um, before they kind of lose the faculties to. Um, adapt to new situations um you know i don't know uh, is there uh, uh, the best design uh yeah it's i mean there's lots of interesting stuff like she's um she's really really wants to be useful all the time that's like um i think that's it's kind of kind of similar to dealing with children as well, right? Because um, children really like to be useful. They want to help, even when it's not um, practical for them to help. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm having to let her do cooking as much as I feel safe letting her do cooking. And, you know, she kind of screws the food up a little bit, but I, um, I feel like it's important to let her do some of it because she feels, um, you know, she feels like she's, she's being helpful. Um, and uh, so there's probably design. Thanks, Drew. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, I think you hinted at some when, I, you know, you say that people can actually split that time and ritualize it and you have to kind of balance um, issues of autonomy, like doing things for someone versus ensuring they have an outlet to be more active and to contribute. Um, yeah, and it, I'm sure COVID, you know, 
adds a layer of challenge to that. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, she, she doesn't, um, she doesn't understand what COVID is. So she thinks we're just being really mean to her that we won't let her, let her go to the store. <laughs> but the thing that you said about being useful, I mean, it ties to the, the, the child labor quote unquote thing too, which is that, yeah, they love to be participating. And if you can make them, uh, if you can involve them in a way, like my son loves baking um, and the, the four-year-old will help with whatever you can get him to help. So even if it's not, you know, strictly useful, they're like, well, you know, go nuts and we'll see how it goes. But I remember my dad grew up on a farm in Southern Alberta. And I think by age eight or so, he was driving the tractor. It was just, that was what you did, you know? Um, I think we uh, are actually done with questions. Jordan, maybe you want to give Jordan or Pam or anyone want to give a couple of last uh, words to wrap it up? Go ahead, Pam. Yeah. Um, well, uh, Thank you guys so much for uh, for coming out tonight or watching this recording as the case may be. Uh, we hope that we can continue to uh, think through some of these issues uh, via the Act Collective and elsewhere. And please, if, um, if any relevant thoughts, um, projects, endeavors, shower musings, anything comes up, please uh, feel free to get in touch. And um, yeah. Thanks again. Thank you, everyone.